What's up, what's up, guys? Ricky here. Do you love Most Valuable Podcasts? And are you like myself where things that you like, you just have to let people know because they've got to be on your T-shirt at all times? If you do, you're in luck because we got Most Valuable Podcast T-shirts. You've probably seen myself, Dave, Mark, Sean, Brandon. You might have seen us wearing these T-shirts in videos. The good thing is now you can get your hands on one too. How do you do so? First off, send us an email, mostvaluablepodcast at gmail.com. Give us your name, your size, your address. We will then send you an invoice through Square. That's how you'll pay for it, $22 per shirt. And then after we get the money, we will send you a great Most Valuable Podcast t-shirt for you to wear so you can tell everybody that you love listening to Most Valuable Podcasts. So go check it out. The directions are also in the description. What are you waiting for? We got the shirts just for you. But Brandon, let's move on into six through 15. And let's start at number 15. Who you got? Run us through your six through 15, starting at number one, five. At number 15, I've got Deron Payne, defensive tackle from Alabama. See, I don't think you said that right. It's Deron bringing the pain. Oh. Deron, because he brings the pain. Get it? He brings the pain. He I, brings the pain. I, and now, I, and now okay. I've got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And number 14, front of the show, Mo Hurst, defensive lineman from Michigan. Number 13, Roquan Smith, linebacker from Georgia. Number 12, your guy, Calvin Ridley, wide receiver, Alabama. Number 11, James Washington, wide receiver, Oklahoma State. At number 10, Quentin Nelson, um, offensive guard, uh, Notre Dame. Number 9, Arden Key, defensive end, LSU. At 8, Baker Mayfield, quarterback, Oklahoma. At 7, Derwin James, safety, FSU. And at 6, Sam Darnold, quarterback, USC. We're going we're gonna to get into that in a second. Let, let me run through mine really quick. At number 15, going with Rashawn Evans, inside linebacker from Alabama. Then right above him at 14, his uh, roll tide mate, Calvin Ridley, wide receiver from that same Alabama team. Number 13, Orlando Brown, offensive tackle, Oklahoma Sooners. Number 12, Derwin James, the safety from FSU. 11, Denzel Ward, the cornerback from the Ohio State University. Number 10, defensive tackle out of Washington, Vita Vea. Number 9, the offensive guard from Notre Dame, Quentin Nelson. Number 8, the outside linebacker from VT, Tremaine Edmonds. Number 7, quarterback from Wyoming, Josh Allen, and at number six, the linebacker from Georgia, Roquan Smith. So first guy I want to ask you about, and it's because I didn't expect him to be outside the top five, but why you got Sam Darnold at number six? Take me through that thought process. Well, it'll make more sense when we go through my five Mm -hmm. through one, but the reason why I've got Sam Darnold outside of the top five is because I did I did something that I did not think I was going to do, mm-hmm. and I I don't think I even had him in my 1.0. But Josh Allen, I added mm-hmm. Josh Allen to this list, and I wasn't I was not, and most people will probably remember I was not the highest on Josh Allen. You'll remember I was no, not the weren't. highest on him. But he had an excellent he had an excellent um, senior bowl. And working with all those guys and everything like that. And I know you're saying, Brandon, you're not telling me why Sam Darnold's outside of it. By the way, you did not have Allen. I had Allen at 9 in the 1.0. No, I didn't. So Josh Allen, spoiler alert, mm-hmm. is in the top five for me. Well, now. duh. Um, so Sam Darnold has, has dropped out. Just, just one outside the top five. But Sam Darnold, for as good as he is, and let's take a look at... What he did this past season, Mm -hmm. he did some good things, completed 63% of his passes, over 4,000 yards, 26 touchdowns, 13 interceptions, but he was up and down. Mm -hmm. He was up and down, and he even admitted that confidence was an issue with him in 2017. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't... Be confident every. I'm not saying you have to be confident every single time. And oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? Blah mm-hmm. blah blah. You know, still still a young kid, still a young quarterback. But he's got to have some improvement in some different areas, a little bit more so than I think the other two quarterbacks that I have above him. Mm-hmm. 
Improving decision making, that's got to be number one. Because of the interceptions that he threw at the times that he threw them in the bulk that he threw them in some of the games. His eye movement and certainly his confidence. The thing that has him outside the top five for me the most is his confidence and where that is moving to an NFL team. Now, the reason I say that, let's say uh, things go just wacky and he goes number one Mm -hmm. to, we know, the Cleveland Browns. Unless they trade the pick. Is that... Is that going to be good on a guy who's maybe not where he'd like to be confidence-wise to go to Cleveland in no. terms of confidence? That's not good. Especially when there's no guarantee that you'd win a lot of games in Cleveland your first year. And, you, we, I mean, we saw what happened with Deshaun Kaiser. Is he in? And, is he and, out? Is he in? Is he out? Oh, he's not going to start. Now he is going to start. And, and, and I mean, look, look at what we—just by that, just mm-hmm. by that alone, but then look at— and I know it's it's Kaiser himself, and Darnold's a different guy, but mm-hmm. the amount of interceptions that Kaiser threw. I mean, he led the league. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's going to be Sam Darnold, but that's not... You, you want somebody, and you want Darnold to be able to go to a spot where he's mm-hmm. going to fit, where he's going to feel like he's got some confidence, where the confidence is going to be built, where they're going to be able to help him, where he's going to grow, where maybe the things that he needs to still work on... It's like talking with you're talking about Lamar Jackson in the first segment. You know, he's got so much athleticism, so Mm -hmm. much talent. It may just need to come out a little bit more and take a little longer to come along. I'm not saying that. Having the right coach, too. Exactly. And I'm not saying that Sam Darnold is going to take a long time to come along, Mm -hmm. but maybe he's going to take just a little bit more time than a couple of the other ones to get where he'd like to be. And I still think he's very good. Uh, There was a scout that said that he seemed. He felt like there were too many people that were hyping Darnold as this overly elite quarterback where he said that when he looked on film, Mm -hmm. he didn't see Darnold as being any better or leaps and bounds better than a Mitchell Trubisky or Deshaun Watson Mm -hmm. from 2016. And that to me, Trubisky, I think, is going to be very good. Watson has would have already, been rookie of the year if he didn't get injured. In my and, mind. Yeah, Watson. Hell, Watson could have been MVP if he didn't. Get if injured. he didn't get injured, and I know that maybe is a little bit of a bold statement, but mm-hmm. with what he was putting up, if he kept that oh, he anywhere very close well. to what he was doing, mm-hmm. he would have been MVP. Mm-hmm. So that's why I have Darnold where I have him. I still think six is a strong spot for him well, right now in Big Board 2.0. And the thing I'm gonna, I'm actually going to. Because I had him at seven. I'm going to bring Josh Allen into this discussion because we're kind of comparing the two anyways. And when I was looking at, because right now I don't want to give away everything I'm going to say in those videos, but compiling everything for the draft breakdown videos that we're going to be starting soon here at MVP, out of the quarterback, some of the things I was looking at with Sam Darnold, I was seeing like, you know what? He is accurate. He does have some good pocket presence. He's a mobile guy. He's got the instincts. I love what I saw on film. The big thing that I, it's true, but I don't want to use it as like a crutch or I feel like everyone uses it to where it's like, yeah, but he had it down here. Oh, but he lost how many weapons? Like how many people went to the NFL? Part of, part of me is like, okay, yeah. He lost a lot on the offensive line, and in order to be a quarterback, you need to be protected. So, I mean, some of the sacks I'm not putting against him because his offensive line was garbage. But part of me also goes, that's college. Like, that's college. People leave. You got to make sure the coach puts the right people to be in the position to step up, and he just didn't have those players stepping up. The things that are the huge weakness, the biggest weakness for me you said confidence. I'm going mechanics. and With Darnold? Or with, with Darnold. Okay. With Darnold. And the reason why is there was a part in the film where they compared it to Russell Wilson where his arm was down. It's like, oh, look, at he's doing what Russell Wilson does. But as I kept watching and watching, I'm seeing this. This is the motion I'm seeing. And I'm sitting there going, Tim Tebow had that motion. Like, we ragged on Tim Tebow for how long it took him to get the ball out, 
because instead of just coming up and throwing, he was doing a complete circle with his motion, and Sam Darnold has that. Now, I'm not saying that you can't teach to get that out of there or Sam Darnold can't fix that, but he needs the right coach. He needs the right system to help him with his mechanics because, to me, that's the big thing that will hold him back at the next level. When I looked at Josh Allen, though, besides his accuracy and his decision-making, because the thing I liked better with Darnold that I didn't like with Allen is Darnold could look cornerbacks off better than Allen could. One guy that we talked about in the first segment ended the segment with, Josh Jackson. There was a time, Allen, hike, look, look, throw at that one receiver. Guess who was there to intercept it? Josh Jackson. Josh Jackson is almost like an NFL corner. NFL corners will do the same thing, if not taking it back to the house. That's the thing that I felt with Allen. However, Allen's strengths is he's got the size, he's got the arm strength, and he's a good athlete. Doesn't have the same mobility that Darnold has, but he's a good athlete. So to me, between the two, even Rosen in there too, it all depends on which one you like the best. If you're a guy that's like, you know what, I love what Darnold's ceiling will be because I've always said Rosen has the higher floor, Darnold has the higher ceiling, Josh Allen could be the wild card, where he could be third right now, could end up being the best quarterback of the three. He's got potential as well to come out. It's whatever you want. Which one can I work with? Which one can I mold into my guy? And if your confidence issues, you mentioned, if you're a coach that says, I don't want to deal with that, then don't take Darnold. Take a Rosen, take an Allen. But if you feel like, hey, I can give him that confidence, kind of like how Andy Reid gave Kareem Hunt confidence when he was starting as a rookie and after he fumbled on his first NFL carry, even though he never fumbled in college. That's something that you can think of, too, is which one fits me? And that's going to be the most important with either all three of these quarterbacks if I brought Rosen into it really quickly. Exactly. I, I think that it's it's all your preference. It's mm-hmm. all your preference. I, I, I mean, I think truly, if you looked at every single one of these quarterbacks, mm-hmm. not one of them comes without something. Are any of these guys Andrew Luck? No. And that's the thing you got to think about. None of them are the Elways, the Lux, where it's like, I'm drafting you. You are perfect, almost perfect day one. There, There's hardly ever going to be a time. Mm-hmm. And and you guys, are our fans, our viewers, you guys know this. There's hardly ever going to be a time where you're going to get a quarterback that's completely flawless, that mm-hmm. has utmost confidence, that has spot-on accuracy, that has a great arm, that has mobility and, and movement outside of the pocket. Mm-hmm. I mean, that does not come along often. Yeah. Where they have every single one of those things where you check marked all the boxes. Mm-hmm. Hardly ever happens. Are they almost always coming with uh, most of those? The the top ones? Mm-hmm. Yes. Which is where I think we're out, we are right now. Yeah. But it's really what you said. It's which one do you like? Mm-hmm. Which one fits your scheme? Which one do you feel like you could mold the most or the the best, the easiest, the quickest? Well, it's like it's, you brought it, up Trubisky. Look at him with the Bears. Ryan Pace said that's our guy, and he traded up to get him. Plenty, and he mm-hmm. traded plenty to yep. go get him. So I, I think it's it's definitely one of those where Sam Darnold, mm-hmm. do I think he's bad at all? No, no. not at all. He's going to be a good quarterback. But do I... I, I, hopefully, I, I gave my my reasoning mm-hmm. for why I have him outside the top five at number six. It's for me the the biggest one is probably where his confidence mm-hmm. is at, and the reason why Josh Allen is on mine right now in the spot that he's in is because his confidence right now is through the roof. He had an outstanding senior ball. Mm-hmm. He had an outstanding game. He was able to do that with working with NFL coaches and coaching staffs. Mm-hmm. He's in a good spot right now. Well, the guy I want to – let's move on away from the quarterbacks. And confidence is the thing I want to look at that this next guy, only because it looks like NFL scouts and NFL personnel people might not have the most confidence in Arden Key right now. I did not have Arden Key in my top 25. Spoiler alert, he's not in my top five. You have him at number nine. And before the podcast, you were telling me – 
you had seen something on WalterFootball.com that NFL scouts are kind of weary of off-the-field issues with Arden Key? Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things that came out, and this is... And both you and I, we've known mm-hmm. that you know he's had some injury issues in the past and everything like that with LSU, but I had never heard anything mm-hmm. of off-the-field issues. But I, I did read here that uh, Key's off-the-field issues are similar to Randy Gregory or Tim Williams, and that those there's concerns that because of that, mm-hmm. that could slide him down on draft boards mm-hmm. into late rounds, because of the off the field issues, I don't know what those are though. Yeah, I, I mean, I just now am hearing about this tonight, mm-hmm. and I, quite honestly, I mean, I'll, I'll look into it a little bit more. But if if there's anyone who is a huge LSU fan, Arden Key fan, that you, you know exactly what they're talking about, please let us know. But I, Arden Key for me though, and what I've said a lot of times is, is it enough? Is it enough to push him outside of someone's draft board? Mm-hmm. Is it enough to make a team that really wanted to go with them skip over him because they hear they are told about off the field issues? That's that's the question. Now, if he were falling to the Dallas Cowboys, they take him. They don't care. They'll take you with all the baggage you got, anything you got. They it does it does not bother them. But there could be a team out there that really likes him, that needs him at the position, and they will skip over him because they want to try and run an organization where you have stand-up guys, class act guys, everything like that. But Arden Key, here's the thing. A lot of people look at him as being a high first-round talent. I mean, he's a devastating pass rusher. He was mm-hmm. really, really good in, in college. He's a guy who could be even better in the NFL. But he can only do that if he's going to stay on the field. So yeah. you you don't want to um, you, you don't want to have a guy that you invest in and then isn't able to consistently be on the field for you because they have off the field problems. Well, and the thing that I look at, and I'm going to bring in a guy who was in my first segment in my 16 through 25. It's not going to help Arden Key that you see guys like. Marcus Davenport, who, yeah, he's from, I want to say just, oh, he's from University of Texas, San Antonio, UTSA, the Roadrunners, I believe. However, you look at Davenport, just like Allen in my situation, had a good senior ball, got to A, work with coaching staff, so I believe he was on the South, so he got to work with the Texans coaching staff, I believe, but... You work with NFL coaches, you impress scouts with that, impress scouts throughout the week. He was one of the guys that they listed as one of the biggest risers from the senior ball, and that's what I think is going to hurt Arden Key of, yeah, he's good, but are we going to want to waste a first, not waste, but are we going to want to use a first-round pick on him, knowing that he has the injury questions, he's got the -the off-the-field issues. I looked at an article just now as you were talking where, yeah, this was from before the season, but um, his father had talked about how he's looking for a rebirth um, through this year because of some of the off-the-field issues that he had. People thought he was going to quit on LSU before the season, and the thing that's going to help Arden Key the most throughout this process is the combine. It's going to be those interviews. I feel like because of this, if it's true with all the off-the-field stuff, if especially like you said, if it's in the same vein of Randy Gregory and Tim Williams, of there's two prospects then that need a phenomenal combine. Baker Mayfield and Arden Key. Only because of the Baker Mayfield, because of the little off the field that he has, even though it's he transcends it on the field. And you just want to, with him, it's I just want to talk to you to make sure that I can forget about that stuff that happened with Arden Key, it might sound like, hey, I need to talk to you to make sure that I can have you on my draft board because if I can't have you on my draft board, that's going to be a problem and you're not going to be there. Absolutely. And it sounds like um, Arden Key Sr. saying, you know, let mm-hmm. the past be the past. You know, we had our we had our um, things that we said than done. we had our challenges and we worked them out as a you know as a family and mm-hmm. we're still working through them and everything and um, he said that you know kind of his son's issues evolved from his instant success um, 
and it, it became uh, his life became unbalanced. So those types of things that worries it, me. It, well, it makes you it makes you want to think. Okay, is he going to be okay mm-hmm. when he gets into the real limelight? I mean, and this, he's now that's, getting a paycheck. That's college. That's yeah. college limelight. Um, and you know, having the kind of celebrity status as a college athlete, mm-hmm. which is when you're especially, you know, on, on a, no, I was going to say, especially on a big stage mm-hmm. in, in one of the biggest conferences in the SEC, yeah. that's a, you know, on a good, really good kind of high profile mm-hmm. LSU team. Can you handle it if you're on an NFL team, any mm-hmm. NFL team, I don't care, be on the Cleveland Browns. Yeah. You know, you can be on the, the, the worst team, the best team, you're still on an NFL team getting recognition mm-hmm. people in your in that city know you people um uh, nationally know you it's it's a big deal it is a big deal and quite honestly i'm i'm never going to have to deal with that i'm never going to be playing mm-hmm. a a a major league sport I, I wouldn't I don't know if I'd want to. I don't know if I'd want to deal with that because mm-hmm. just in talking with someone who I had used to used to work with and who had kind of uh, been in the pros for for a little bit with baseball, and I know I'm getting a little bit off the subject, but kind of staying on point mm-hmm. is he said it's it's a grind. you he said only the obviously the top ones are making it. For everybody else, it's a grind, it's a grind, it's a grind, mm-hmm. it's a grind. And for those top guys, they have no life. They're all living it in the limelight. Mm-hmm. They all have to do ev- everything they do. Someone's in their business. Everything they do, someone knows about it. So for a young guy, and this goes for everyone coming out of the draft, that's that's why they have those sessions when they the the new uh, draftees mm-hmm. come in. They have that session that talks about the transition. To life in the NFL with Herm, he used to be with Herm yes. Edwards, and it how, won't be with Herm anymore. And, and how it goes, and how not necessarily how you're supposed to mm-hmm. act, but how you're going to need to act. Well, and for me, hearing what you just said about um, Arden Key Senior, where it's one of those things where hey, it's him adjusting to that. Right now, before talking to him, if I was an NFL scout or owner, I'd be like, "Well, I'm worried. We need to talk to him. But we I, need to talk to him." But I do want to say that mm-hmm. I don't want to. Put that those uh, that comment out of context. Yeah, he did go on to say he's changed tremendously. He's had to get his priorities together. He sees life out of a different lens because he stepped away from well, football for a little bit. He's never been away from the game. By being away, he appreciates it even more. So that is important to also I would bring still up. Still be worried only because I would not. I would. It wouldn't be where oh, I'm not going to give you the benefit of the doubt to talk to you. If I'm a team that's looking at Arden Key, then I would be like, you know what, we got to talk to this kid because I want to get that straightened out because the thing that's going to make it different at the NFL level is, yeah, you might have handled your shit here in college, but now in the NFL level, you're getting paid, you're getting a paycheck, and kind of relating it to outside stories that we've heard, how are you going to handle it then if... Because there have been stories from pros, and this might be taken out of context a little bit, but I'm going to say it anyways. But there have been pros that are like, yeah, you know what? Uh, I become an NFL player. I get that paycheck. Then so-and-so, who I haven't talked to in five years, starts talking to me again. Or those family members start asking for, like, you get that. Like, are you going to be able to deal with the pressures of being, kind of like you said, a celebrity, being a pro football player? And I want to make sure... That you're all in this because the thing with the draft and the thing with players, and I know that you don't want to think about it this way, but it kind of is. But to the owners, it's an investment. Like, I am investing a draft pick in you. I could draft millions of other guys. Not really millions, but you get the point. Bajillion. Bajillion other guys. That's a real number. Scientific number. Bajillion other guys besides you. Why should I pick you here? I'm investing in you if I'm picking here. And the thing with owners, the thing with these businessmen that are owning these teams, if I'm going to invest in something, I want return on my investment. And if I don't feel like I'm going to get that return on the investment because of like off the field, or in this case, the kind of not confidence, but the dealing with being a star at LSU, which to me as an NFL owner, 
is small potatoes compared to, I'm going to say, Jerry Jones. Compared to Jerry Jones, small potatoes, you're a Dallas Cowboy now. You are now America's, you're on America's team. LSU is small potatoes to me. But let's move on into Raekwon Smith. And the thing I want to ask you about Raekwon Smith, you had him at 13, got him all the way up at 6. This is a kid, Brandon, that ev- immediately after we did our big board, we did it beginning of December. As soon as those playoff games happened, the national championship, even though they lost, I looked at you, I believe. I know I told this to Mark. I said, yeah, Roquan going to be climbing. He's going to be climbing. I think I said it during the national championship game of, I'm like, Roquan's going to climb. Rashawn Evans is going to climb. Jerome Payne going to climb. That's what I said. And Roquan Smith on mine climbed the most as he was six. Where did I have him on my big board? One. I had him at 17 on my first big board. Now he's at six. What did you see from Roquan Smith that made him climb all the way up to 13? Well, for me, it's just uh, he was one of those guys that really came on strong in the second half of the game against Oklahoma um, when they when they played each other. Pardon me. You yes. actually had him fall two spots. You had him at 11 in the 1.0, and you have him at 13 now. However, you've got you've got guys like Josh Allen who – jumped above him which could have knocked him down a little bit and a couple of jumpers yeah um but no i still i still like roquan smith i thought that he was one of those guys who came on really strong in the second half of that Mm -hmm. game against oklahoma was a really big force in the second half of that game against oklahoma especially that game the way he's able to get off the ball i I think just his 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 speed is his, his athleticism his strength He's one of those guys who you do not want him coming at you. Uh, I, I, I like what he's able to do. I like what he's done throughout his seasons at Georgia. He's been one of their best, if not their best, playmaker defensively. He's been he's been great. Mm-hmm. I, I, I want to know I want to know more because you did have him jump all yeah. the way. So what was it that that you saw in him that made you jump him all the way to six? My first thing is his point of attack. Like, he is a guy that is is great against the run. His instincts overall of being able to know where the ball is and take the best best path to it. Hits like a mad truck. He's quick. He can kind of, like I said, his instincts knows where to put him. My favorite thing about him, though, is no matter what scheme I'm running at the NFL level, he fits into it. Whether I'm running a 4-3 or a 3-4, I don't have to worry about, oh, does he fit my scheme? He fits my scheme. And that's the most important thing. And, like, he's the guy that I feel could be, yeah, people could say, oh, he's undersized, that, I mean, he could have issues getting off the blocks at the NFL level. But the thing that I think is most important here is what's going on right here. And Roquan Smith has what's going on in here because he's able to anticipate and read what's going on in front of him with the offenses that he was seeing. Kind of almost like um, a little bit of what I'm thinking is kind of like what we could see with like Ray Lewis or Brian Erlacher. And I know you're saying, Ricky, Hall of Fame linebackers are thrown out here. I can say that now because they're going to be in the Hall of Fame. But even though it might not be out loud, in here I feel like he could be a guy that kind of does the pre-reads before the snap to know how to attack and how to get to the ball to either stop the running back or get to the quarterback. Well, I think one of the biggest things, and one of the biggest things that that you just brought up um, at, and, at, in one of your points there is that he's not just good in defending the run. Mm-hmm. He can also defend and be solid in pass coverage yep. as well. Mm-hmm. That's what's going to make him even better. That's what's going to make him kind of that all-around defensive presence. He's got great ball skills, too. Because, you know, there are some guys, and I truly I can't think of any mm-hmm. right now specifically, but there's some guys who, man, you run at them, you're, you're not getting any yards. But you go and you you play in the pass, and they, they, they can't do anything against mm-hmm. you. So... Having a guy who has that 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 dual threat, he's going to be active in the in the um, r- uh, running game in terms of defense. He's going to be active in the passing game in terms of defense, pass protection, run protection. He's going to be around and he's going to be in your face. You're going to be hearing his name on mm-hmm. tackles and on plays. 
that's the kind of guy you want defensively on your team, leading your team on defense. And the guy that I think that he could be like the most out of the two that I just mentioned was now don't take this as an exact carbon copy, but I feel like he could be almost like a Brian Urlacher esque player to a team because I know the height and size undersize. Like Brian Urlacher was six four and he's two hundred and fifty eight pounds in his playing days, where you've got Raekwon's six one, two fifty five, but when I think of Brian Erlacher, not only could he make the pre like the pre snap reads where it was almost like a chess match out there. It's like except for the Super Bowl with Peyton Manning, quarterback says one thing, you, Brian Erlacher's point. He's putting people into situations. He knows what to do, but he was also a guy that run the ball at him. He's gonna stop you, except when you're Tom Brady and you juke him out of your shoes, or if you pass. He's going to deflect it, make a catch, and he was quick to be able to pick up balls. That is someone that I could kind of see Roquan being like at the next level for a team, although he might not be the exact same height or the exact same size, brings the same things to the table that a Brian Urlacher did out in New Mexico. Yeah, I think that those... When you compare a guy to a Brian Urlacher, you're de- Hall of Famer. You're, you're 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 definitely comparing him with the guy who had some mm-hmm. tremendous skills. A guy who, and I won't say single handedly because it wasn't single handedly, but without him, the Bears' defense is not what the defense is. It's not or, the monsters well, of the midway. It was. It's not the monsters of the midway. No, without it's, him. It, it's not mm-hmm. because he was the heart and soul of that defense mm-hmm. for a number of years. A number of years. That's why he's going into the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Without him, without his skills, without his tenacity, without his aggressive play, the Bears are not... I feel like they haven't been good in a while, but the Bears are not good during those years. Mm -hmm. The Bears aren't competitive during those years. It's it's so crazy how how sometimes one guy completely Mm -hmm. changes the dynamic of a team or of a unit. It really is. Would they still have been okay... They still would have been okay, but you take away Brian Urlacher, and you're taking away heart and soul. It's hard to replace heart and soul. Mm-hmm. And if Roquan Smith can come in and not only be a guy who has the physical skills and play, but also has the mental capacity, the mental tenacity, and the heart and soul to bring to a defense, watch out. Yeah, and I mean, before I bring up the very last person, there's like, there's teams that I'm thinking about, and especially at that top, obviously the top five are not going to take them, but the one team that I kind of look at is, I was thinking about, could you imagine him on the Jets, bringing that Jets defense back to what it was, bringing that Buccaneers defense back what it was, and the guy who could use, the team that could use him the most, John Gruden in Oakland. If he's there at six, why not take a Ro- or Roquan Smith and sure up that defense to help out uh, Derek Carr because you're going to need to help him when you're going to Vegas in a year. The last guy I want to bring up, though, and this will end the segment before we go into the top five, this is a guy I just wanted to mention because I really liked him from the film I saw, especially from the film of him against Josh Rosen because that was one of the top quarterbacks that he was going up against this year. And that's Vita Vea, one of the huge jumpers in my big board. Wasn't on last time. He's at number 10 this time. This is a guy who, he's a big guy, a big guy on that defensive line. And the thing I like most about him is for UCLA, I'm going to use that game for example, for them to stop him consistently, they needed two guys on him. They needed to double-team him every time. This is a guy that even if he's not able to punch through the line every time and get to the quarterback like he did against Josh Rosen at least once in that game, he could be a guy where it's like, all right, we got to put two on him, or okay, we got to put a, um, we got to bring in a tight end because we're putting two guys on um, Vita Vea to make sure he doesn't get there. Could a guy that's just a big defensive tackle be a top 10 pick in the NFL draft? That's what I want to ask you 
only because you didn't have him in your big board, I did. So just on the draft side, could you see a big defensive tackle like Avita Vea being a top 10 pick in the NFL draft? No. No. Top 10, I just don't see it. I just don't see it. When I look over here and I look at, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. I No, I mean, I just, I don't see where he fits mm-hmm. in the top 10. I know that this is my own big board, yeah. which people will disagree and agree with certain spots. And, and uh, you know, it's everyone has their own thoughts and everything on it. And it really comes down to the team. But where it it looks to to me right now, I don't think so. Could he be a a first round pick at somewhere, possibly, but he'd probably be more of a second round or third round. Mm-hmm. And yeah, this is one where my big board. You guys will see my big board and my mock draft are not going to line up because if there's no teams, and I'm just saying pick, 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 pick. Vita Vea, I love him as a top 10 guy, a fringe top 10. I have him in the top 10, but I could easily on a given day put Denzel Ward there. I could put Orlando Brown there. I could put Derwin James there. They're just that close. But I think that he'll end up, mock draft-wise, being a teens guy. He was just one guy I wanted to bring up because he was one in my personal big board. The biggest jump virtually on my big board, going from unranked basically to top 10 and being at number 10. But any final thoughts that you want to bring up between anyone that you had in this range in your big board? No, I think we're good. This is where you guys come in. Let us know what you guys think down below on any of the guys we talked about for six through 15 and let us know who you guys would have through six through 15 on your own personal big board. 